Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started here. For those, those of you that don't know me, I'm Dick White, I'm one of the trauma surgeons who has had a side interest in history and think that along with Santana, if you don't remember where you've been, you won't know where you're going. Or, if you don't remember history, you're doomed to repeat it. I think the last election just demonstrated that. As Veterans Day. Oh, thank you, that's right. I was going to say, this is Veterans yeah. Day, and so we thought we'd talk a little bit of military history here. Okay, well, so we're going to talk about battlefield medicine and the Civil War. Now, why did we choose this? First of all, I need to demonstrate this. The Civil War is actually one of the first wars that we actually have medical records on. Uh, and that's because at the start of the war, the Surgeon General, or actually partway into the war, Surgeon General mandated that all the records be kept. And, and then they published these six volumes, Medical and Surgical History of these War of the Rebellion uh, <clears throat> over about a 15-year period. But anyway, we have amazing statistics. I mean, they're not perfect, but we have amazing statistics for the Civil War. Now, those of you that are from here probably know this, but if you're not, there was a significant battle of the Civil War fought in Mansfield. Uh, it ended the Red River Campaign, which was a push by the Union to get to Shreveport, actually capture Shreveport was a key point, uh, coming up from New Orleans. And it was a combined uh, Army and Navy campaign. Uh, they fought at Mansfield, and the South actually won. They pushed them back. Uh, and what the question we sort of asked was, OK, so we had a battle. There's a park there. What do we know about what happened to the soldiers if they were wounded on the battlefield, how did what mattered to them? Because they generally weren't too interested in all these fine points. They're interested in how am I going to be treated? And I think what we're going to show is that things weren't as bad in the Civil War as people thought. Okay, so we need to look before we start this. We need to do some background. And the first thing is state of medicine in the United States, uh, because medicine was not really organized. Uh, most common practice actually went back to Benjamin Rush, who, if you remember, was a signer of the uh, Declaration of Independence, uh, who was instrumental in the development of psychiatry in the United States, but also was a, shall we say, vigorous proponent of the bleed versus blister and purge. In other words, if you're sick, make you sicker, you'll get better. And this still continued up to the time of the Civil War. Medical education in the United States was varied. There were universities that had medical schools, and there were universities in Europe that had medical schools. But most doctors went to private institutions, which basically you passed if you uh, <coughs> you passed if you made it all the way through because they didn't pay their tuition until they passed. And so there was obviously a push to pass everybody. Most of these schools consisted of four to eight months of lectures, uh, which were repeated the next year, and then you were a doctor. Some people didn't even do that. They just did an apprenticeship and followed the doctor around until he said it was okay for him to go out. So the level of medical skill and the medical knowledge was widely varied at that time. Plus, you also had to deal with the fact that there were other multiple non allopathic systems available. I mean, this homeopathy, naturals, medicine, bone, bone breaking, or bone, yeah, bone setting, rather. All of these things uh, sort of were out there as in competition to allopathic medicine. So anyway, that's where things were at the time. Lister to a sepsis was still six years in the future. Past year was even longer in the future. Now, the other thing we have to think about is how were the armies prepared for this? Because the Civil War was devastating. The weapons in the Civil War had changed. Tactics had not. So at the start of the war, the US Medical Corps had 113 physicians total, 30 surgeons and 83 assistant surgeons. And remember, surgeon does not mean the same thing back then as it does here. It does not. At the start of the war, 24 of these, three surgeons and 21 assistants, went to the Confederacy. So basically, there were under 100 physicians in the entire United States Army. Now, those of you that remember, 
remember that the war was not really fought by the United States Army. It was fought by volunteer units from the various states. And they had their own way of getting their doctors. Uh, some of them just brought along the hometown doc because these were uh, units that were formed uh, locally. So they just brought the hometown doc. And this might be some guy that you know, was actually trained. It could be just anybody. The Army had uh, requirements for somebody to be a military physician, but they were oftentimes ignored, particularly when you consider that this appointment was by the state governor. So there was a lot of politics involved. The end point is that the soldier in the Civil War, particularly at the start, was very likely to meet somebody uh, if he was wounded who wasn't particularly qualified. I mean, think about a small town doctor. You know, what type of wounds is he going to be treating in his normal practice? But they just took this guy and took him out to the field. Okay. Even more so, like I said earlier, neither side recognized the huge current that this war would produce. Uh, between the start of the 18th or the 19th century and the Civil War, there was a major change in the way munitions were created. The, uh, yeah, the mini ball, uh, all of a sudden, if you looked at the tactics uh, before 1800, basically they lined people up and they shot at each other, and the guns were so inaccurate, oftentimes shooting at each other didn't do anything, they just missed. Uh, but that changed in the Civil War. Rifling had come in, and so all of a sudden things were accurate. And not only were they accurate, but they were very large, damaging uh, projectiles. Plus shrapnel had come in. It was invented by an Englishman. Uh, so all of these things produced wounds that nobody was prepared to treat and nobody understood was likely to happen. Even more so, medical organization and we'll see why in a minute, lay way behind what was needed. Um, in fact, to be honest, there was no medical organization. This is all because lessons learned in previous wars were totally ignored. Nothing new. Now, going back to where all this comes from, prior to the Napoleonic Wars, if you were wounded in the war, there was oftentimes a hospital, it may or may not be, depending on how the guy running the war felt about it. Uh, and it was your job to get there. And if you didn't, too bad. In fact, the Duke of Wellington in the wars, Napoleonic Wars had basically forbidden all soldiers to help a buddy back to the aid station. You're just supposed to lie in the field until the battle was over. It saved a lot of pensions, probably. Anyway, but these places, when they're out there in the field, are called ambulances, or ambulances. I'm sorry, my French isn't very good. Uh, and ambulances, and this basically meant for people walking. People who walked up to the hospital. This changed, at least on the French side during Napoleon's era, with this man. This is Baron Dominique Loray. Uh, Loray was the Surgeon General, if you would, of the uh, Napoleonic Medical Corps. And he organized the corps for the first time. This, is, this was something that was drastic. Uh, first of all, the ambulancias became hopital ambulante, meaning it was, a, it was a unit. It wasn't just a place. And he actually organized care. Uh, chief surgeon, 340 personnel. I mean, this is almost modern. It was divided into divisions. Uh, they had their own uh, material, they had their own vehicles, and these units could be split off to go wherever they needed to be. This, this is a modern concept, amazing. In 1814, nobody had said anything or done anything like this before. I mean, it had things like this. I always liked this. I mean, it's a minor point, but these are actually two of Napoleon's uh, med field medics. Notice they're each carrying a lance, which, which can be used as a weapon, and they each have a backpack. Well, if this converts to a stretcher. So, I mean, they're really amazing. They really thought of amazing things. Loray designed all sorts of equipment. I mean, even down here to a camel transport uh, when he was fighting in Egypt. So, again, this was totally unheard of at the time. 
So the ambulance, this became known as the ambulance volante, the flying ambulance. And this was basically uh, where we get our present term and our present concepts today. The difference was that the ambulance volante actually took the hospital and tr to the wounded and treated them on the field. Okay. Well, after the Polanic Wars, obviously France lost, and so this was not widely disseminated. Remember I said that Wellington just let you lie in the battlefield until the battle was over, and then if you had a buddy to help you to the uh, dressing station, that was fine. If you didn't, well, three days later they came and picked you up. Uh, <clears throat> after the uh, Napoleonic Wars, we fought another, or another series of wars were fought in the Crimea. This was the French and the British on one side for a change against the Russians. And the French did remember Lorraine. He, he was actually widely known through Europe uh, and highly regarded by all sides. The French remembered him, the British, of course, did not. And so when it came time for the war, they had to sort of modify gun cards, modify things to transport the wounded. The concept of wounded transport hadn't been there on the British side. But they did sort of modify things. And they became quite ingenious at this. So transport actually came to the fore as opposed to straggling into the station. Now, the United States had observers over there. I mean, we, we sent people to look and see how the British and the French were fighting their war, uh, just as we do in most of the wars. And this was published uh, in this book, The Art of War in Europe. And it described, I mean, mostly it described tactics and weapons and how they were used in the various battles. But there was a, a section in here devoted to medical care of the wounded. Uh, and this is Dill, Dillettefield, uh, was the author of this, although there were several people well known, and including Jefferson Davis, who was the one that basically sent the guys overseas to watch the war. And this is what he said. He noted that all vehicles were under the control of the medical officer, and the details and requirements of this medical branch of service should not constitute a part of general transport service. In other words, they should have their own vehicles. They should have ambulances. And this was the recommendation by George McClellan, who was on this committee. And he also recommended the establishment of an ambulance corps. And the Army established a committee to consider ambulance designs. And several very useful things came up. This was the initial committee. Uh, no reason you should know any of these names. But this is what they recommended is that the ambulance transport ought to be furnished for 40 men per thousand, uh, 20 to be taken, transported in the reclining position, and 20 sitting, that both two and four wheeled ambulances were necessary for hospital service, that a two wheeled ambulance, and this is wrong, it turned out, is the best for conveyance of dangerously sick or wounded men. This was their recommendation in the 1850s. They also recommended each company have two wheeled ambulance, that each battalion have five companies, of uh, five companies have one four-wheeled ambulance and five two-wheeled ambulances, and then each regiment have two four-wheeled and ten two-wheeled ambulance wagons. In other words, you're supposed to carry your ambulances with you. Okay. And there are several designs that put forward. I always like this one. I think it's kind of cool. It's like, you know, the Civil War RV. Mm -hmm. You know, pull the tent down, it becomes a place to stop and a, and a place to live at night. I thought, always thought that was kind of cool. This was the ambulance, which, by the way, was the worst design of all of them, that was approved by the committee, basically because it was designed by a member of the committee. It didn't matter, though. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, I, I wonder whether, in hindsight, maybe they had something in that the, those were typically very fast. They were faster than four wheel although they weren't, it didn't have the utility that the four wheel Well, it was basically a matter of they bounced around. Uh, they were too unstable. They were unstable. Okay. And, and this was actually shown by, in the Crimean War. I mean, they tried them all, and they found the two-wheeled ambulance was Just too the least desirable. Okay. Because it seems like because the two-wheeled would be you faster. Would 
that's I mean that's the buggy that they would race with, so that would be yeah, you would make think, sense. But it actually, doing actually it turned out that's yeah, not, it turned out not to be that way. I mean that's what they thought, I'm sure. Uh, anyway, it didn't matter what they thought because Congress just rejected everything. This was partially due to this gentleman. This was Thomas Lawson. He was the Surgeon General of the U.S. Army at the time of the start of the Civil War. He was 72 years old at the start of the war. If you look on various ref references, he's actually sometimes said to be 80 or 80 plus, but according to the Army records, he's 70, he was 72, which doesn't seem that old at the moment, but uh, <laughs> anyway. He had been Surgeon General since 1836. He entered service at age 19 as a naval surgeon's mate. He, we have no idea what kind of medical training this guy had. He probably was one of the apprentice type. He saw active service. I mean, he, he did do his job. He saw active service in the War of 1812, the Seminole Wars, the Mexican-American War. And one month after the Civil War started, he died of a stroke. But he was responsible for what happened following that. And the reason I say that, he was also, he was also what? Horrific. Now, some of these may also be apocryphal, uh, but he was said to be, to consider medical books extravagant, and he didn't need them, and once found out that one unit had two sets of surgical instruments and felt this was a waste of money. Congress loved them. <coughs> okay. Medical budget for 1860 was $90,000. That's about $7 per soldier for the year. Well, he died. And they replaced him with this guy. Notice the name? This is the guy from the committee that designed the worst ambulance. Uh, he had a little field experience, although he'd been in the Army since 1818. He was also thrifty. Congress liked him. He lasted six months. The fi thing that final, finally ended his career was the Port Royal campaign in South Carolina, where he he was requested by the command to build an ar army hospital to, for care of the wounded and said it wasn't necessary because the climate was warm. So, at the start of the Civil War, what we had was some committee meetings, two surgeon generals that really didn't understand or know or have any concept of what a major conflict would be like, and a medical corps that was unchanged from 1777. Ambulances were not under the control of medical units. They were under the control of the quartermaster. Now this has been a recurring theme in the Army. Uh, quartermaster keeps trying to get assets back, but it always turns out to be a disaster because medicine always gets the short straw. Anyway, this was a comment from Dr. Henry Bowditch, whose son was actually killed at the Battle of Bull Run and went down to examine and see what was going on and was appalled and reported this to the uh, New York State Medical Society and is actually instrumental in the design organization of the sanitation committees, which basically, through the war, uh, changed the way medicine was practiced. The other thing that happened was this gentleman was appointed Surgeon General, William Hammond. Interesting guy, rather strange, had seizures, but he was very foresighted. He and Congress didn't get along, and he did not get along with Stanton, and so he didn't make it through the war. But before he was replaced, he appointed this man. This is Joshua Letterman. And Letterman was appointed, everybody seems to think that he was like Surgeon General. He was actually just the Surgeon General of the Army of the Potomac, which is where the major battles were being fought. But Letterman totally redesigned in three months the medical corps. And look at this. Basically, what he did, he repeated LeRae's model. Every corps had organic transport, meaning they owned their own ambulances, and they were under medical direction, not a line officer. Every regiment had two to three ambulances. Every division had 30 ambulances and ambulance trains. And the medical officer was the one that said where and when these things could go. In other words, a quartermaster couldn't pull an ambulance, put a bunch of ammunition on it, and send it someplace else. Something else that was even nice is he appointed a line officer to handle support, but that line officer 
God forbid, report it to a medical office. Okay. Ambulance drivers, for the first time, were really separated by uniform so they could be recognized. And this is before the uh, Hague Conventions and the Geneva Conventions where medical personnel were recognized as non-combatants. But nevertheless, they were distinctly separated, they were distinct, and they treated both sides. Regimental hospitals, which were things that were being dragged around with the various regiments, and which again were under no control, became frontline aid stations. Uh, and one of the things he looked at was, you know, who, who goes back to the fight? And there was a mobile surgical hospital between the frontline aid station and the rear area general hospital. So let's look and see what these all things came out. Uh, medical duties were divided. There was one physician from each resident or from each regiment established a dressing station. This would be the equivalent of the battalion aid station. Uh, remain, remainder of the physicians were at the division hospital, and they all had set duties. And only the most experienced operators did the surgery. So here's one strike for the wounded soldier. Now this only applied to the Army of the Potomac, uh, but it was so successful that in 18, or 11 March 1874, it became federal law and applied to the entire military. Now, the Battle of Mansfield, which is where we started, was actually in April, uh, but the Red River Campaign was underway, so whether or not this was being applied to the armies at that time, I can't find any information. Now, looking at the Confederacy, because there was another side, even though we won. Uh, there was another side, and basically, they had about the same plan. They were actually very innovative, and that was because of these two people, Samuel Preston Moore and Julian Chisholm, two very forward thinkings who thought much along the lines of Hammond and Letterman, and created a Confederate medical corps that was very similar in, an as in all aspects to what the uh, Union had. Uh, they started off organizing this for peacetime, and they basically assigned one surgeon, one assistant surgeon to each regiment, uh, and then recommended additional personnel if things got hot. They, they basically recommended the Medical Reserve Corps, and I think this is interesting. Every soldier in the Confederate side was supposedly vaccinated against smallpox uh, on induction, and I think this is very advanced for this time. But I guess the question is, where we started, this was, what did this mean for the guy lying in the field with the bullet hole in him? Well, this is how this all worked. At the start of the battle, the surgeon established a field hospital. This was the assistant surgeon that was sent forward to the, uh, or the surgeons established a field hospital to the rear, but the assistant surgeon went forward and established a dressing station. Uh, and if you look at maps, and if you go through the uh, War of the Rebellion, there are actually some maps of some of the well-known battles that show where the hospitals were located. I couldn't find anything for Mansfield, and, the, and these things are too detailed to really project. But it, it is interesting. They, these guys were right up there at the front treating the wounded. Once they were treated, they were transported to the field hospital. The field hospital, remember, was established by the regimental surgeon more to the rear, and this is where anything definitive was done. Their transport was usually by litter, but it could be by one of these various ambulances. This, was, this turned out to be the most common ambulance used. And actually, this is the ambulance that after the war was modified and became the first civilian ambulances in New York City. And places like this were where the uh, stations were established. You know, houses, churches, any place that gave shelter, or sometimes in a tent. You can see here a soldier being operated on in the, uh, in the stable. Now everybody thinks, they think the Civil War, they think amputation, right? Uh, there's a couple reasons for this. One, it was the most commonly performed operation. Why do you think that was? So, well, if you operated on a significant extremity injury, you're likely to survive. If you had a truncal, a head, or an abdominal injury, you weren't likely to survive, so they were probably triaged first. So they were the first ones to make it to the, make it to the uh, dressing station. They were the first ones to make it to the field hospital. They were most likely to survive. 
Notice that the statistics haven't changed. 50% died of head injuries. And that has not changed either in civilian trauma or military trauma unless you wear a helmet. And this is supposedly the day, I think this is incomplete, but this is the best data they had at the time. At the completion of the war, this is uh, what was found. These are all the amputations done. Notice they're listing 20,000, almost 30,000 amputations. Twenty thousand survived. Now this is amputations of everything starting from the fingers all the way down to the thigh. But nevertheless, they had that's 60% survival. I mean, it's pretty good. Okay, the next thing we need to talk about, because everybody thinks that everybody was held down screaming and just had their leg chopped off or their arm chopped off, what type of anesthesia was used? Uh, this is what everybody thinks of, you know, bite your bullet, have a little whiskey. But actually, uh, anesthesia was, com was commonly used. There are 80,000 anesthetics on the Union side. We don't have numbers for the Confederates. There are 80,000 anesthetics on the Union side. Uh, and this is what's recorded. So there's probably more. Uh, alcohol was often given first, particularly if the patient was in shock because it was felt to be a stimulant. Mm, didn't work too well, but whatever. Uh, we don't know how much alcohol was used or how often. It was just known that that, that oftentimes was what was done. Of the 80,000 anesthetics, 76% were chloroform, 15% were ether, and 9% were a mixture of the two. So let's talk about a little bit about anesthesia. Morphine first came around in 1805. Nitrous oxide was around. Ether was around. It had been around since 1275. And chloroform was discovered in 1832. So opium and its products was, were known in ancient Egypt. So this, this particular drug has been used since ancient times for pain relief and for some type of uh, sedation for, uh, for whatever operation I'm going to do. Morphine came along in 1805. So this was well known by this time. Nitrous oxide. I wonder if anybody in the audience knows the name of what morphine was called in the Civil War. Because it, was, it didn't go by the term morphine. It, was, it had a different name. So if you look at the list of what the battalion stations had as, as medications, there's this medication that's very prominent. It was laudanum. Which actually is a tincture. That's actually laudanum. It's actually a tincture. From the Latin laudo to be praise. So it brought praise on, which I suppose you can see Morphe doing that. But that was the, that was the Civil War, um, not brand name, but what they call, well, we now call yeah. Morphe. Yeah, it was, a, it was actually a, a liquid. And, and actually, it was like a law. It is. Right. It is. There you go. <laughs> anyway, nitrous oxide was around. It was discovered in 1772. Sir Humphrey Davy used this on himself for dental pain in 1800. Uh, it suggested it might be useful. It was very popular with student parties. <laughs> uh, in 1844, Horace Wells had his own molar removed. Uh, more about Wells in a minute. Uh, he had successfully removed over 10 teeth. So the dentists were the, actually the first here. In 1845, unfortunately, they attempted to demonstrate this at an operation in Massachusetts General Hospital. They underestimated the amount of nitrous oxide. And as we all know, nitrous oxide is not a really successful anesthetic for major surgery, although they weren't really doing major stuff. But anyway, the patient became agitated, passed through an agitated state. Uh, they had to hold him down, he was screaming, and it got a bad name. And Wells left in disgrace. Ether, been around since 1275. It was also popular at medical student parties. Didn't have any medical use until 1842. Crawford Long removed a tumor from a neck, but he didn't publish. By 1846, he'd used it seven times. Still didn't publish. In 1846, Morton, who was a partner of Wells, remember Wells was the guy that tried nitrous oxide, also a dentist, used it in a dental procedure. And in 1846, it was first used to remove a tumor at the Massachusetts General Hospital. 
under ether, which was administered by Morton, who had a fancy gadget to administer and wouldn't tell anybody what it was, because it was going to be his secret. Anyway, this is the common surgeon. General this is no humbug, and this is the start of anesthesia. Wells' gadget was like this. Basically, this was a sponge, uh, which was soaked in ether. It had an air vent over here and a mouthpiece, and you breathe this until you went under. Now, the thing about ether, it's a very safe anesthetic. Uh, it's very easy to use, very predictable, passed through four stages, which are very easily recognized. Uh, so it's a very safe anesthetic. It smells bad, produces nausea and vomiting, was used at parties, just like beer. Uh, so what was the problem with it? Well, it's explosive. Those of us from the north remember using pouring ether down our carburetor throats in our cars on cold winter mornings to get the car started. It blows up, and one of your major source of light is candles and fire. Probably not the best choice. But remember, it was still used about 20% of the time uh, for anesthesia in the Civil War. Chloroform, on the other hand, had come around in 1832. It was first used in childbirth in 1847. Remember, it was, uh, Queen Victoria had chloroform for one of her births, one of her many births. Uh, and it became widely used. It was used extensively in the Crimean War. So I mean, this is well known. There were 25,000 cases were cited in the Crimean War. So I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like this was a surprise. It smells good, has rapid onset, it's chemically stable, it doesn't blow up, uh, but the patient passes through an excited stage where they very, become very agitated. It's much harder to control. Early deaths were reported using it, probably in some of the people that weren't shot and some of the people that had gotten alcohol. But anyway, long and sh short was there were surgeons in the Civil War that refused to use it because they felt it wasn't safe. So. Now for chloroform, the most common mode of administration was a handkerchief folded in the cone, which was soaked with chloroform or had a sponge which was soaked with chloroform. And he held over the nose until the patient went under. Uh, Chisholm, remember, he was the guy from the south, uh, re re recommended use of a funnel with a bar to hold this in. So he basically, he had a funnel mask over the face, sort of like our present anesthetic masks. Uh, most commonly, however, a handkerchief was placed over the nose and the agent dropped on, which was a bit of a problem if you were in an open air theater. Now, one of the problems for the south was lack of supplies. Chloroform was not readily available. Uh, I mean, it had to be imported. They didn't have anywhere to make it. Uh, and so Chisholm developed this little gadget, which I mean, again, this is amazingly out of its time. Chloroform was, this was an air intake. Chloroform was in here, and this was placed in the patient's nose, and they breathe, they breathe. And this way, he minimized the use of chloroform, minimized waste. And the North just sort of I did whatever they did. Now, I sort of put this up because people sort of still have this idea that anesthesia wasn't used. But these are actually pictures from the Civil War. This one, I don't know about it. It's all over the place. I can't find any documentation where it was. Uh, but the, this is actually from Harper's. And, and this is from a soldier's medical or a soldier's notebook where he just drew things uh, during the war. So he had, made, had a diary which he illustrated. And the thing I want you to notice is every one of these pictures shows an anesthetic used being administered. So anesthesia was not absent from the Civil War. OK. Eventually, once you're at your field hospital, eventually one of two things is going to happen. Either you get sent back to the fight, or you get transported to a large military hospital. And again, transport buried. Their large wagons were used. Uh, this, this this actually is from Harvard Hospital, which is in Washington D.C. Uh, the month Gettysburg was fought. It uh, transport. They were prepared by now to transport a large number of patients. Uh, train cars were modified. This was actually from a German observer who uh, was. You know, observing the Civil War for the German army, uh, described the uh, use of railroad cars.
transport. Even more so with hospital ships. And these were all new concepts. Hospital ships. But anyway, long and short is they moved all of these back to a general hospital in the rear, where you either got, stayed for a while and then got discharged from the military, or maybe got sent back to the fight, but um, more unlikely. Uh, in the north, the Pavilion Hospital, and this was a new concept too, uh, it did also come out of this, the Crimean War in Florence Nightingale. Uh, the Pavilion style hospital, which basically was a bunch of long huts, if you would, uh, single story, no more than two rows of cots, so everybody wasn't wedged in. Had, ventilation was recognized by Letterman and by Hammond as being very important. Had ventilation, well, good ventilation, uh, and actually was a major step forward from just crowding everybody into wherever they were and lying on the floor. And more in the south had a similar design. There was a very large hospital just outside of Richmond, which uh, was very similar. Anyway, by 1863, there were 84,000 beds in 182 hospitals. So that lets you know a little bit about the number of wounded and casualties in the Civil War. This is one, one hospital. This is mostly tents. But you can see how it was organized. And you can see that actually there was individual patients. This actually was up in Baltimore. And you can see a combination of tents, which were probably staffing tents, and then the hospital itself up here. Looking inside of one of these things, first of all, you can see how it's spread. And the interesting thing is that when I was first in the military, there are actually still some hospitals built on this design. I mean, besides the fact that it was good for ventilation, it was much harder to blow up with an enemy shell, and it was safer in a fire because fire could be isolated. But anyway, this design lasted for years. Anyway, this is what it looked, Harvard Hospital in Washington, D.C. looked like. And the interior, it's, you know, this is a major step forward from what had been provided in the past. This is the Armory Square Hospital, which is, those of you that know Washington, uh, was on the mall. It's actually where the uh, Space Museum is right now. So what's all of this come down to? All right. Uh, this is actually wounds during the Civil War. Now, the first one was amputations, which I'm sure was understated. And I'm sure this is understated, too, because remember, this is just what could be gleaned after the war from the documents that were sent in. And I'm sure in the heat of battle, a lot of stuff didn't get mentioned. But anyway, look at some of these numbers. The gunshot wounds. 200,000, no, 20, yeah, 200,000 gunshot wounds. 33,000 deaths. I mean, that's really remarkable, you know. Now, again, that, that includes people that caught a little flesh wound, but still, out of 23, or 235,000 wounded, only 30,000 died. Remarkable. And I'll sort of end with this, because this is, uh, and if you look at the, uh, again, the history of the War of the Rebellion, this, this was a guy that was shot through the acetabulum. He was actually an officer. He recovered from his wounds, and there are pictures like this all through the uh, documenting uh, cases, all through the uh, history of the War of the Rebellion. Uh, he survived his wounds. Not only that, he went up after leaving the battlefield, went up and ran a uh, prisoner of war camp as the commander, and after that had a successful career as a lawyer. So this guy got took, well, oftentimes would have been a lethal injury, and survived. So with that, I guess if you're interested, these are the, probably the best books just to look at. But are there any questions? I think, you know, have we sort of uh, convince people maybe things weren't as bad as everybody uh, suggests that you weren't going to be held down screaming. Now, it is the perception that you got a piece of leather to clinch between your teeth and they hacked your leg off. Yeah, that's actually that's the perception everybody okay. has. Or a bullet. So, are, um, 
you know, uh, the answers that the, 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 the last summer, um, you know, Tom Cruise's character, you know, wouldn't let them cut his leg off. Oh, and the answers with wolves? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, okay. So. Yeah, they, they were not amputation crazy. But the fact was that if you had a significant extremity injury, if, you were, if it was amputated, you had a very high rate of survival. If it was left and it festered and became infected, remember Pasteur wasn't yeah. there, Fleming wasn't there, even Lister wasn't there. If it was left alone and festered, you would likely die. And so, you know, yeah, amputations were done fairly frequently. Uh, and they were probably life-saving in most circumstances. I've seen many places quoted that the mortality rate from a femur fracture in the Civil War was about 50 percent. Um, and the challenge that I have, you know, the survival from amputations is quite good, but the challenge is that includes amputations of fingers and, right. and relatively innocuous uh, injuries. So do you, do you have a, a, a list that actually gives? Um, as uh, best as, because a lot of the stuff just came in as, you know, partial information. Right. I mean, think of the information we get about stuff now from outlying, outlying facilities, and then think about some guy in the battlefield that's having to write everything down in candlelight after operating on 20 people. Let's see if I can find the. Uh... There you go. There's the amputation. And again, there's amputations of the thigh. So yeah, it's, it's pretty thigh. close. Well, yeah. So if, they're, if you're surviving less than 3,000, it did the thigh. So and that makes sense, just because if yeah. they tried to if they tried to fix them, the oh, they didn't attempt to, to, They didn't attempt to fix these. Yeah. I mean, if, if there's an open fracture of the thigh, almost all of these got amputated. And I strongly suspect a lot of them, the reason why this was so high was not the surgical technique, was not the person doing the surgery is most of these people are going to come in in shock, which wasn't recognized at that time. Probably got a, a jolt to help them along, and they got put under under an anesthetic. So that's probably, you know, I don't think it's the amputation as much as the condition these people came in on. Questions? 